Well, good afternoon and welcome everyone to MERS's September investment webinar. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners on the lands on which we meet today in Australia and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Kia ora to our friends joining us from New Zealand and a special shout out to people in Melbourne. Uh, I think we're all really hoping that this is your last couple of weeks of hard lockdown. For you, it's, it's good to see those numbers starting to come down and hitting the required targets. Um, welcome, I think, to anyone who's joining us for the first time today and for our regu regulars, welcome back. Um, we really appreciate your ongoing support. Um, so on to introducing our speakers for today. Uh, so firstly, I'm Kylie Woolman, Chief Investment Officer for Mercer in the Pacific, and I'm really pleased to be your host for today's webinar. Um, we're going to have a little bit of fun today and pit colleague against colleague in a debate on modern monetary theory. Uh, is it a good thing or a bad thing? And presenting the four case will be Yaying Dong, our market strategist in the investment strategy team. Hey, Yaying. And presenting the against case will be Guion Moore, our head of investment strategy. So good luck, gentlemen, in today's debate. You will be asked to vote for a winner at the end of the debate. So please uh, make sure that you listen in carefully and consider the points made. And then rounding us out today will be Cameron Taylor. Hi, Cameron. Uh, Cameron is a senior investment consultant in our Perth office. And Cameron is gonna talk uh, to the risks and opportunities of including gold in your investment portfolio. We will have a poll at the end of Cameron's presentation as well. So please be ready for that. We're gonna have time for questions at the end, and these can be submitted at any time using the Q&A uh, function within Zoom. Um, and so we'll pick, come back and pick all of these questions up at the end. So please feel free to, to put them in there whenever you think of your, your question. Uh, so on to our modern monetary theory or MMT debate. And before I hand over to our debaters, I do realise we're not all economists, so I thought I'd do a quick overview of what MMT is and why we're hearing so much about it right now. So according to Wikipedia, the source of all truth, MMT is a non-orthodox macroeconomic theory that describes currency as a public monopoly and unemployment as evidence that a currency monopolist is overly restricting the supply of financial assets needed to pay taxes and satisfy savings desires. So I'm not sure if that's helped the non-economists amongst us, so maybe let's, let, let me break it down a little bit. So MMT is really just a different approach to economic management, one that puts less focus on the importance of a balanced government budget and more uh, focus on a balanced economy. So what does that mean? Under traditional economic theory, government deficits are generally thought of as a bad thing, used, or used only in emergencies. And governments are thought to be doing a good job when the budget is balanced or in surplus. So under traditional theory, the main tool which an economy is through which an economy is managed is monetary policy. That is the movement of the official interest rate up or down by the central bank to control the price of money. MMT changes that thinking, and rather it proposes that it's okay for governments to run deficits as a norm, and indeed to create or print, if you like, money in order to invest in economic growth and productivity as a standard part of the tool. To be fair, the name is a bit confusing because MMT or modern monetary theory is actually less about monetary policy as the primary economic management tool and more about the routine use of fiscal policy or government spending and taxes to control economic growth, inflation and unemployment. So MMT reverses, I think, many of the assumptions that, that we used to think about economics, particularly the role of government spending. Normally, we think that when a government wants to spend some money, it must first tax the money or borrow the money that it needs before it can uh, spend it. But MMC says, no, that's, that's back the front. It's around the wrong way. Governments are the makers of money, so they don't need to borrow it. So a government can pretty much create and spend as much money as they like, and then tax or borrow it back if it needs to. Uh, so, uh, you know, what would, what would cause a government to need to stop spending? 
Well, when the economy starts to get overstimulated and inflation becomes a problem. But if the government spends the right amount of money, then it's possible to achieve a balanced economy that is full employment with low inflation. Uh, so on to the next slide. Why, why is there so much talk about MMT today? Um, so this slide gives us a few of those reasons. But ultimately, there are growing concerns that the heavy use of monetary policy over the past decade has resulted in very high prices for financial assets, things like shares, and uh, high housing prices, which arguably has only benefited certain parts of the economy and society. Whereas at the same time, we've experienced higher levels of inequality, higher debt levels, low wage growth, and low economic growth. And also with interest rates at all time lows and looking to stay there for quite some time, monetary policy is arguably running out of steam as an effective policy tool. The COVID pandemic has only exacerbated this situation with the ongoing need for governments to run deficits to support the economy through the shutdown period and then to support the recovery through investment in productive assets such as infrastructure and education. Throw in the need to invest in the uh, transition to a low carbon economy in order to address climate change and the voices of the MMT proponents have never been louder. So with that, let's hear from our own MMT proponent, at least for the purposes of today's debate. Um, over to you, Yaying, to tell us uh, or convince us, if you like, why, why MMT is a good thing. All right, um, thank you uh, for the introduction, Kylie, and I think you've absolutely uh, nailed uh, two very strong reasons for why MMT is clearly going to be the solution for tomorrow. Now, my first argument uh, in favor of MMT uh, is firstly due to the ineffectiveness of monetary policy. And so when we think about traditional monetary policies that came into effect during the late 1970s, real growth in the economy was high. And so during periods of crises, central banks had sufficient room to lower interest rates and to spur economic growth. However, economic growth over the past 20 years, especially over the past 10 years, has been incredibly low. And so as a result, central banks have found themselves with little room to ease policy. So as an example, before the start of the COVID crisis, the Fed funds rate was only at 2.25% compared to around 5.5% during period, uh, during previous crises. And you can see this uh, in the chart on the left-hand side here. So monetary policy has just failed to lift off in an environment of low growth. And so from a crisis management perspective, central banks will face off against the same constraints in future periods, which then greatly reduces the efficacy that low interest rates can provide to the economy. However, central bankers have not given up. They have experimented with a range of unconventional policy tools, such as quantitative easing, which is the direct purchase of government bonds in the market. And as a result, we have seen an explosion of central bank balance sheets uh, as a result of this policy. And you can see this uh, in the chart on the right hand side, where on a global basis, if we add up all of the major central banks, there's almost around 25 trillion uh, in, in total asset values. Now, whether quantitative easing in itself is an effective policy is still largely up to debate. But as Kylie mentioned in the introduction, I would say that quantitative easing has created a set of unique problems, such as pushing up the price of financial assets, which has exacerbated inequality. And so this brings me, brings me back to the MMT framework. Now, MMT argues that governments can issue their own currencies uh, with no real financial constraints. And so during periods of crises, governments can simply issue more money 
for circulation in the economy, which will support demand and encourage economic growth and inflation. And this is going to be very unconstrained, unlike monetary policy. I mean, how much can rates really go uh, in this environment? Now, critics of MMT, which you'll hear from very shortly, will point out that this will create rampant inflation. Now, that could very much be true. However, what many people fail to realize is that just as governments can increase the supply of money in the economy, they too can decrease the supply of money in the economy through taxation, which will place a lid on inflation and keep the economy in balance over the longer run. So are these concepts so unique to us? Well, in fact, I would argue that we are already witnessing many of these elements play out in the current environment, especially when fiscal policy becomes an increasingly active uh, role uh, as part of supporting the recovery. Now, in terms of my second reason for why the MMT framework is going to be much more superior than the traditional economic framework, is that it is going to provide much more flexibility to governments. Now, in particular, governments will be playing a much larger role in the economy than before. Now, this will be quite crucial uh, for developed economies as they are currently undergoing profound structural changes. Now, many of these structural changes will be well known and well documented such as the aging of the population and trends in globalization. But there are also a number of trends that are not so well documented, such as the gathering momentum across the digital revolution, which includes the rise of robotics, artificial intelligence, and automation. Now, from classic economic growth theory, the largest driver of long run sustainable economic growth is going to be total factor productivity. However, productivity growth has been very weak across the developed economies. You can have a look at this in the furthest chart uh, to the left. Now with the impact of the coronavirus, productivity growth is going to become further impaired. And so under a traditional economic framework, the role of government intervention in the economy would at best be temporary, and eventually the government would need to consolidate public finances. Now, the danger is that the rush to balance the budget too quickly will create adverse impacts in itself, especially if private sector investment fails to take off. Now, in the aftermath of the GFC, it took many years until private investment returned. But this is not always going to be guaranteed. Under an MMT framework, governments can, also, can always guarantee spending across areas that will be directly productivity enhancing, such as in infrastructure, in wireless technologies, schools, and health. Now, growth in these sectors is clearly going to be very beneficial for the economy's long-run development and higher government spending, no doubt, is also going to support private sector investment. Now, structural economic dislocations will also put immense pressure on the labor market, and it will take a significant period of time in order to achieve full employment because we all need to retrain for future jobs. Now, the labor market in itself is already becoming much more globally integrated through the application of technology. Uh, this debate that we're having through Zoom is an ideal example of that. And now there's also growing automation in the workforce, uh, especially in areas where cognitive ability is needed. And so there's research from Oxford University that suggests artificial intelligence may displace up to 47% of all jobs within the next 15 years. Now, if you think about that, that's going to cause a massive rise in structural unemployment. And so governments would need to step in in order to provide some sort of universal basic income or become an employer of last resort in order to mitigate against these adverse 
uh, social effects. And finally, the MMT framework is going to allow governments to better target redistributive policies in a period of rising inequality. And so if we conclude and think about the structural changes that are happening in our economy uh, being accelerated through the pandemic, we can see that we are only at the very beginning of this long adjustment process. Now, traditional economic theory is just going to become increasingly ill-suited to the challenges of tomorrow. And so that is why we need to seriously consider the merits that an MMT framework can provide. Thank you. Thanks, Yaying. So some really good points there around the uh, running out of steam of monetary policy and the need to solve for structural changes in the economy. Um, so over to you, Guion, to give us the uh, against case. Uh, thank you very much, Kylie, and thank you, Yaying. Um, so I, I agree with Yaying. I think he's really um, astutely identified two truths. Um, firstly, that there are lots of problems at the moment and there's a lot of change going on. Um, but also that's perennially true. Um, secondly, they're giving our governments unlimited power to print new money, potentially unconstrained deficit spending, to put it euphemistically, opens up much broader range of policy options. Absolutely, that's true. However, does it follow that giving governments, you know, our competent and esteemed politicians, the power to print enough money to buy potentially everything in the economy <clears throat> result in those problems being solved? I suspect it doesn't. I think it's more likely to result in even more new exciting problems. <clears throat> Excuse me a sec. Uh, my basic argument against MMT is twofold. Uh, firstly, that it's really quite dangerous and where it's been tried before, it has either resulted in catastrophe or been quickly abandoned. Uh, secondly, that it's entirely unnecessary, by which I mean that if you have sensible and economically viable proposals, they can be implemented within the current institutional and financial framework. You only really need MMT for bad ideas. Firstly, why is MMT so dangerous? Well, we need to be clear, MMT isn't just about using more fiscal policy rather than monetary policy or running big, bigger deficits. It actually involves quite substantial institutional change. There should be no ambiguity, phrases like, you know, consolidated central bank or coordinated fiscal and monetary policy or more policy freedom mean one thing. It means an end to central bank independence. Essentially, the RBA and the RBN, or the RBNZ would become part of the Department of Treasury. Maybe not all at once, but inevitably. It means monetary policy, interest rates being set in cabinet meetings to suit the political objectives of whoever is in control of the printing press at that time, and no real checks and balances on government spending. One of the outcomes of this is that politicians can just keep spending to subsidise whatever pet project they favour or client group they want to, whose support they want to buy. This is the familiar South American corruption, collapsing currency, high inflation, unstable democracy model. We've seen plenty of examples around the world. Um, I'll highlight two, a worst case, Peru in the late 80s, and a best case, France in the early 80s. The worst case, uh, in Peru, the government attempted to implement an ambitious plan of redistribution and development uh, through excessive deficit spending, nationalizations, and direct control of the central bank. This resulted in the currency collapse, annual inflation of almost 3,000%, skyrocketing unemployment, almost total economic breakdown, and was followed by the election of an authoritarian government and severe austerity policies. A more moderate and better managed attempt at, MMT, at an MMT-like approach was undertaken, undertaken in France during the first term of the Mitterrand presidency. Again, this resulted in repeated devaluations of the, of the French franc and the whole approach being abandoned after two years um, and a program of austerity being brought in to bring the deficit under control. Not a complete catastrophe, but only because it was abandoned so quickly. So when MMTs say, spend money and tax it back, what actually happens is currency devaluation followed by economic austerity. The tax it back part of MMT can mean great social trauma. Next slide, please. 
And yes, Ye Ying is right. Monetary policy as a tool for managing the economy is, uh, you know, more or less hit the end of the road. And fiscal policy will need to pick up more of a burden over the medium term. But that's not the same as saying we need to adopt MMT. That's just normal Keynesian economics. Throughout this pandemic, we've seen governments around the world have the ability to engage in very substantial deficit spending to support our communities through a period of crisis. But this has only made sense insofar as it is a temporary measure. Implicit in it is the promise that when the economy returns to normal, the deficits will be brought back under control in due course. Similarly, if you have sensible investment proposals that are economically viable in their own right, you don't need central banks to monetize government spending. The private sector will be more than happy to invest for an appropriate return, either by buying government bonds directly or co-investing in projects. On the other hand, if you want to use deficit spending to engage in vanity projects or subsidizing your mates or to push some particular agenda, well, in that case, you probably will need a central bank to monetize the spending because it would be very hard to persuade others to participate. We don't need MMT to tackle climate change or inequality or manage te rapid technological change. What we need is realistic proposals that make sense. MMT, if, it's, is, if it is anything, is a distraction and a temptation to engage in magical thinking. MMT is not the solution. It could really be quite dangerous. And at the poll at the end of this, I ask you to vote against it. Thank you. Thanks, Guion. Some great arguments there from both sides. So we are going to bring up the poll. Um, so just, just to summarise, Ya Ying for the four case, uh, basically saying it is good policy, it's needed to solve uh, issues like structural unemployment. And essentially what Guion's saying is uh, it's bad policy, it's like ice cream or sweets, it tastes good in the moment, but uh, unhealthy for you in the long term. So. We're starting to get the votes coming through now, waiting with bated breath. Okay, so we have a winner, which is on the against side. So congratulations, Guion, you've managed to convince everybody that uh, MMT might, well, well, fiscal policy, use of fiscal policy uh, is a Good thing when needed but not necessarily needed as part of the, the structural toolkit so uh, well done uh, Gui, uh, Ye Ying, nice job as well and I think everybody has at very least learnt um, the, the pros and cons if you like of, of MMT from the, the debate uh, today so, so thank you um, so we'll move on now to our uh, final topic so Cameron's going to talk to us now about uh, gold so we'll hand over to you thanks Cameron thanks Kylie Man has been fascinated by gold since the dawn of time. We describe kind people as having hearts of gold. First place athletes win gold medals and gold is a popular way to celebrate marriage. Over time though, gold has transformed itself, initially serving as the currency standard and a status symbol for wealth, to now be reborn as an admirable monetary and conflict hedge, a safe haven. Today, while gold use is still dominated by global central bank reserves, and this has even been increasing as some countries wish to reduce their reliance on the US dollar, investors are increasingly turning to gold to provide protection to their portfolios in periods of market stress. Furthermore, as a proven store of value, and with ever increasing unconventional monetary policies being deployed, including potentially a broader take up of MMT, Investors are also looking to gold to hedge against inflation risk. Lastly, demand for gold is also being supported by an expanding jewellery market in countries with a growing middle class. And there's also smaller amounts of gold used in various industries, from cancer medicines to solar energy. As an investment, gold tends to perform strongly in low interest rate environments where there are severe downturns in equities. However, this may not be perfectly rational. Shown here are periods of substantial equity market falls over the past 30 years. And whilst it's true that during these events it may have been rational to sell equities, during all events, with the exception of the GFC, 
there was no clear reason for investors to believe that cash was not a safe and appropriate temporary safe haven, at least in nominal terms. The phenomenon of investors believing that gold is safer than cash in a crisis is referred to as a safe value bias. And recent market events show that this bias is as relevant today as it was 30 years ago. Many studies have shown that gold has a close to zero correlation with equity markets over the long run. However, a negative correlation tends to appear when it's needed, with a minus 0.46 correlation between gold and the S&P 500 when the S&P 500 falls by more than three standard deviations. When equity markets have experienced heavy falls, gold prices have risen. Gold mining stocks haven't always held up as well in a crisis, where all equities may be sold down in the rush to create liquidity. However, in all but one of the events shown here, gold equities have held up better than broad market equities. Now, over much longer term history, there have been times when gold has performed less well during market crashes, most notably the Great Depression of 1929. This has tended to be due to the prevailing monetary policy environment. When interest rates are set by the market, and currencies are not debased, gold has been relatively ignored by investors looking to be defensive, with cash and bonds being preferred. But there's no denying though, gold is an effective short-term hedge against market stress. In recent years, gold has had a strong inverse relationship to real yields. So, gold prices have risen as real yields have fallen. Real yields, which are nominal yields, net of inflation expectations, fall as either nominal yields fall or inflation rises. Hence, gold, with its inverse relationship to real yields, is an effective way to hedge your portfolio against inflation. That said, investors would need to monitor this relationship over time, as the relationship between gold prices and real yields could break down in a future where rates have normalised. For the time being though, this inverse relationship remains strong. Over time, a key drawback or cost for investors looking to incorporate this hedge in their portfolio has been the opportunity cost of holding gold, because gold, as we all know, provides no yield. But this disadvantage is substantially reduced when the yields on other asset classes fall. A further and not insignificant challenge for investors when considering an allocation to gold is the ability to assess whether the current gold price represents fair value. The chart on the right shows the extent of gains gold has produced in the past two years. And while this chart's in Australian dollars, the picture looks identical in New Zealand dollars. As gold produces no income, Many fundamental valuation techniques cannot provide a view as to whether the current gold price has moved into overvalued territory. Environmental, social and governance, or ESG factors, are another key area investors must assess before adding a gold allocation to their portfolio. Gold equity has one of the highest carbon footprints by sector, although as the sector is relatively small, the overall percentage of global carbon emissions from gold is still quite low. As gold prices have risen, it's in the interest of mines to increase output. And this can potentially come at the expense of deforestation, greenhouse gas emissions, water wastage, and as labour practices vary greatly around the globe, the safety of miners can also be a concern. While some of these concerns can be mitigated through analysis of the gold supply chain, Derivative and physical gold holdings come with no voting rights, so investors can't really influence the way gold is mined by purchasing gold in this way. So, over the long term, and absent any significant take-up of modern monetary theory, gold has an uncertain return case. In the last century, gold has beaten inflation, but not by that much, and it's been highly volatile, more so than both stocks and bonds. However, when the world shakes, China, the US, Brexit, US, Iran, COVID-19, gold has proven to be an admirable monetary and conflict hedge. With low or negative interest rates likely to remain throughout the developed world for an extended period of time, and with unconventional monetary policies becoming more widespread, including possibly a broader take up of MMT, 
this has the ten potential to tip the scales towards inflation and gold would offer some protection here. But before allocating, investors need to be comfortable that a gold allocation aligns with their portfolio's ESG policy. In addition, given the extent of the recent gold bull market and the inherent difficulty in assessing a fair value gold price, a gold allocation could be best suited in a portfolio as an opportunistic edge against tail risk events in a low interest rate environment. Okay, so now I will hand back to Kylie, who's going to see what you all think about a gold allocation in your portfolio. Thanks, Cameron, a great overview there. So let's bring up the poll and we're not gonna make it as easy as saying, do you think gold's a good idea or not? But perhaps a little bit more nuanced than that. So the questions you've got here is, do you think gold should be considered as part of a diversified portfolio? Yes, as a long-term strategic allocation. Yes, but only in certain uh, economic conditions, so perhaps more dynamically. Uh, no, it's got no income, so it has no role in a portfolio. And the final one, no, because of its high carbon footprint. Uh, so we'll give you a couple of moments to get your votes in there. Okay, so you can see how the results have come out there and actually pretty strong response on uh, number two, which is really that um, gold can be useful in a portfolio, but perhaps in a more dynamic fashion, only in economic um, conditions. So 52% of the votes are quite a strong outcome, outcome there. So, so thank you very much. Just a reminder, if you can pop any questions you've got either for Cameron on gold or for Guion or Yaying on MMT or indeed any other topics that you might want to ask us questions on or investment topics at least, please pop them in the chat uh, and we will pick them up uh, now. There we go. Um, otherwise, I'll get Guion and Yaying if you can pop your cameras back on for the Q&A, that would be great. Awesome. Okay, so I might just start off with a question, perhaps um, Guion, this is one for you, just back on MMT, and I suppose we've talked about what MMT is uh, and why it's getting a lot of um, airplay at the moment and some of the pros and cons, but I wonder if you could just put a little bit of an investment lens on that and talk a little bit about um, the, the investment implications of MMT. Yeah, uh, you might absolutely. Be on mute. Oh, I, hopefully I'm not on mute anymore. No, no um, you're good now. <laughs> thank you very much, Carly. Um, yeah, so I mean, there, there are a couple of things to highlight. Obviously, um, in, in when I was speaking, I highlighted the, the currency effect there, um, that you often see um, these devaluation events occur uh, in a situation where MMT might be experienced at um, to different degrees around the world. That would, um, in the least, result in an increase in FX volatility. Um, and um, in areas where it's been implemented more, um, relative devaluation. Um, I think it would likely result in an increase in inflation expectations, if not actual inflation, um, and that it's likely to occur in a situation where we continue to have zero nominal interest rates, which would push down real yields, taking us back to Cameron's um, discussion earlier on, that's likely to push up the value of gold. Um, uh, one point that the MMTers make is that um, whenever a government um, goes into deficit, Every dollar spent is a dollar earned by someone in the private sector. That's likely to uh, support earnings and profits for, uh, for corporations, for companies. Um, but also uncertainty around inflation is likely to lower equity valuations. So I would expect to see higher profits, but lower valuations for equity. Um, I hope that gives a good survey. Thanks, very good, Guillaume. Um, there are a couple of questions here still in the area of MMT and they're essentially the same question. So I might put them to you, Yang, as our, our proponent for MMT and it basically saying, are we in an MMT world now? Because if essentially a lot of these tools are being used in the policy toolkit to manage uh, the economies, particularly through COVID, but perhaps even before. Um, so maybe you've got some comments about, are we there already? Yeah, look, I mean, I think that's a that's an excellent question. And, and I would say that in the current 
uh, environment, we're clearly seeing more and more governments sort of pivot more actively towards uh, fiscal policy due to uh, the constraints that we see uh, from, from monetary policy. But I would say that in terms of MMT, uh, the framework is going to be just uh, more broader than, than fiscal policy um, itself. Um, it's more about sort of institutional changes to, to how we uh, perceive the role of government um, in, in the economy. And so uh, I would argue on that front, um, we're probably still at a very uh, early stage, uh, but definitely uh, the embrace towards fiscal policy uh, is going to be a very important role uh, in the current uh, recovery that we're currently uh, undergoing. Okay, thanks, Yang. Cameron, I'm going to come over to you. There's a couple of questions, uh, and they're sort of, I guess, on the implementation considerations of, of gold. So one's asking, you know, difference between gold equity, physical gold, uh, gold link securities, etc. Um, and then the other one is I, perhaps a, a little bit of a, a second leg to that question, which is um, how do you consider, if you were using gold as a tower risk hedge, how would you consider the cost um, of that holding versus um, options-based tower risk hedging strategies? Absolutely. Okay. So thanks, Alex. First on the, the implementation. So at at this point, look, the, the gold market is not as, as deep and as wide as the equity market or the fixed income market, but it is a well-established market and there is a range of implementation options for investors. Now, physical gold is often the cheapest way to access gold, but it comes with clear drawbacks for investors and storage costs is the, the clear obvious one there. In terms of other options, exchange traded funds offer a very efficient and, and are a popular means of accessing gold and, and in that we'd recommend exchange traded funds that are backed by physical gold rather than synthetic ETFs. Um, and then there's a full derivative market, futures, forwards, there's options, um, swaps. So there is a, a, a range of, of methods. Gold equity is an interesting one. And, and while holding gold equity does allow you to, as an investor, to influence the way gold is mined and, and could alleviate some of the ESG concerns about gold, um, it doesn't offer as pure an access to gold or, or a pure exposure to, to gold. So there are offsetting considerations to be made. Uh, in terms of the second question, how would you assess the cost? It really would, could depend on your methods of implementing. Um, there's the, the direct options. If you were using derivatives to access gold, then you'll have the direct cost comparison of uh, puts or calls or, or your other tail risk strategy using derivatives be the cost of your, your gold derivative. Um, that, that would probably be the, the, otherwise if you were looking at holding gold instead of holding as much cash, for instance, then it, it would be the, the direct cost, I suppose, of, of the interest rate you're receiving on, on cash, which as we all know has been coming down significantly. Thanks, Cameron. Um, I might come back to you, Guion, if that's okay. So there's a, there's a question is, firstly, thank you for the presentation. So thanks for that comment. Um, so inflation expectations over the next few years, assuming that means low inflation expectations, will government spending bridge the gap in demand due to unemployment and potential conservatism following the crisis? Um, yeah, that, that's a very good question. It's probably one of the most important investment questions available at the moment. Um, expectations about future inflation. Um, during the depths of the crisis in March, they fell very, very rapidly indeed. Um, since then, they've been progressively returning to their pre-crisis levels and now stand more or less back at where they were before the onset of the uh, pandemic crisis. Um, I think a lot of that in, embedded in it has an expectation around a return to a more normal environment. Um, now, naturally, there's lots of unemployment at the moment. Um, we expect that's going to take potentially some years to get back to normal. Um, and as a result, uh, there'll be very weak wage growth for, um, for a number of years as well. Um, I think the need to support the community in general will mean that governments will be prepared to run uh, non-MMT deficits for quite a number of years from here. Um, so I would, I would imagine 
reasonably strong economic growth from here, a continued trend towards disinflation, or at least quite low, 1% to 2% inflation in the economy, um, and um, uh, a progressive return to normal for unemployment. Thank you. I hope that answered the question. Thank, thanks, Guion. Um, I'm going to come back to you, Cameron. Um, there's another question here, and again, there are probably a couple of questions about how you size or access a gold allocation within a balanced portfolio. Um, so one of the questions is alluding to, I think sort of alluding to the fact that don't you get some exposure through, say, your equity um, allocations? I, I guess that's particularly true for Australian investors where we would have exposure to gold miners, for example. So if you were considering that, are we talking about something on top of that allocation that you you would get? And maybe, I'm not sure whether you've got experience with the clients that you work with, Cameron, about whether they are considering perhaps a gold allocation, maybe in a dynamic sense, how much they'd be looking to build in um, at, at various points in time. And, and yeah, thanks, Carl. Yeah, look, yeah, I mean, it does really depend on a client by client basis what an appropriate sized allocation would would look like. Um, if and and also why you are implementing gold in the first place? Are you using it as a, a tail risk events against equity market stress, or are you looking to protect against inflation and therefore looking to use gold as maybe an alternative to inflation linked bonds? So. The, the, the size of the allocation would really depend on its, its purpose in the portfolio. Um, in terms of whether it would be considered as part of a growth allocation, yes, you do have exposure to gold mining companies, but they're not a large portion of the index. So unless you're with an equity strategy that was looking to, to overweight the, that sector, you wouldn't be getting a, a significant exposure in, in comparison to, to other sectors of the, the Australian equity market. Um, gold, I suppose, has the unique characteristics that it's not a consumed material. Um, so it acts quite differently to other commodities and, and therefore isn't that the demand isn't as tied to the economic growth cycle as commodities like oil or copper would be. So it can behave quite differently and therefore provide that diversification benefits in a portfolio. Uh, but as we said in the, the presentation, it's it's long-term return case is, is uncertain and, and therefore opportunistically um, using it for dynamic asset allocation could be more appropriate than a, than a structural allocation. Thanks, Cameron. And maybe we'll make this the last question. I know we're coming up to time. So, Yaying, I might come back to you. And in his presentation, Guion told us about some of the MMT failures or where countries have tried it and it hasn't worked. I just wondered, um, as a question here about whether there's any examples of where MMT may have been used uh, a bit more successfully. Yeah, so I would say that um, most socialist governments um, would be more willing to embrace uh, some of the more sort of structural uh, proponents of, of MMT, in particular, the role of government. And so I guess a good example of that would be in a country such as in China, where they can issue their own currencies, they face no uh, financial constraints. And we've seen the government there uh, play quite a large role in dictating the overall structure uh, and the direction of, of the economy. And so I think to the extent that we have um, a very uh, successful country that can do uh, and achieve economic growth in balanced terms, um, it is going to be uh, quite uh, a nice example to see how some of these uh, policies can be blended with, with other types of environments and institutions as well. So um, I would say that would be a good example where we have seen uh, MMT deployed in a more uh, positive fashion. Thanks very much, Yaying, and thank you so much, I think, to all of our speakers today. Um, I've actually gotten a lot out of that, so I hope our audience has as well. Um, you, as you leave today, you will get a little pop-up survey asking you for some feedback. We do really value it because it helps us frame up future webinars. Um, keep well, uh, and we hope to see you back for the October webinar. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.